Golden Spiral Media presents The Blacklist Exposed. We promise that this week's episode will not be disruptive, destabilizing, or capable of severing your primary emotional bond. Welcome to The Blacklist Exposed. I am Agent Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson, and I've decided to cancel my little appointment for Red's marriage counseling so we could instead discuss number 82 on the blacklist, Dr. Linus Creel, which aired October 13th, 2014. Show notes and other intel for this episode of The Blacklist Exposed can be found at goldensparrowmedia.com slash theblacklist, where we have a new episode every Wednesday. Now, before we dig in this week, just a big thanks to all the members of the listening community for making the podcast so successful out of the gate. We really do appreciate all the feedback, iTunes reviews, and just general interaction Monday nights on Twitter during the show. Also, we got a bit of news for the fall TV premiere week. The Blacklist has over 19 million viewers, with a third of that coming in from the DVR. That's over 6 million of you watching The Blacklist during the week after it airs. It's amazing to have almost 20 million people watching this show. I just can't fathom that at all. Now, if we could only get them all listening to the podcast, that's the next mission we have for all of you. Is that really, is it 20 million? It's almost 20 million. Almost 20 million people. It's crazy to think that it's like Super Bowl numbers kind of in a, in a way, (laughs) maybe for the fourth quarter of that uh, Broncos Seahawks game. That was pretty bad. (laughs) Well, with that, let's go ahead and find out what you guys all thought of our profiling question last week, which was, does Red really want to kill Liz in the end? Uh, Jess in Atlanta said, I don't think Red is trying to kill Keen. Dream was showing her paranoia. It's more of a father-daughter bond, you hope. Again with the father-daughter stuff. Yeah, well, people keep alluding to a little bit more than, more like father-wife kind of stuff. You know what I'm saying? So I don't, I don't know what to think anymore. My mind is blown. Uh, Kendra, Sandra, Monica, Diane, and Cindy all say, no, no, no. Probably because they're thinking the show will be over if Liz were to die. And honestly, I I like Liz and I love all the characters, but I think this is the kind of show that if you establish the right cadence and the right storytelling methodology, it could survive with almost everybody except Red. Red would have to still be there. I think you have to have Keen. I don't think you can get rid of Keen either. She's very... Yeah, she's integral to the plot. Going, yeah, especially after this week. This week, now I'm thinking it's more Liz's story than Red's story. I've always thought it was Liz's story, but what I'm, what I think is possible is I think Red could want to kill her, but that doesn't come down to a showdown until the very last episode. So there is potential. True. True. Linda clarified her no further by saying his frustration with Liz lately is that ultimately he doesn't know how to control her like he can other people. She is his weakness, and he doesn't like admitting that. That's very astute. I would agree with that. I was going to say very astute. Yeah, based on what I've seen anyway. Now, Princess Smarty Pants, a.k.a. Dina, said, I believe more that uh, Red will kill Liz before I believe they would actually date. I hope so, because that's just creepy. And Mona put it quite simply, perish the thought. I like when people use those kind of words. Perish. I like it. Well, thank you so much for everybody for answering our profiling question of the week. Again, if you want to submit your answer, and we'll talk about our question later on in the episode during the case profile. But if you want to answer that question, just head on over to goldenspiralmedia.com slash the blacklist. We've got a great list of contact methods right there on the left hand side. And you can go ahead and submit your thoughts on what you think this week's answer might be. What is the question again? Our question this week is going to be the big one everybody is asking, who, and I added the or what, who (laughs) or what is behind Liz's secret door? Yeah, I'm going with what. You're obsessed with who. I say what. Maybe there's, maybe she's got like a secret fridge back there and that's where she keeps all her ice cream. I don't know. Maybe she's a binge eater. Well, she's drinking beer. Maybe that's where she keeps her secret imported stash. See, there you go. You guys are thinking... You think it too creepy. I know what some of you are thinking. Maybe it's Tom. Eh, maybe it's beer. You don't know. Maybe Liz is an alcoholic. She did have no problem playing a junkie this episode. For this episode case profile, we're going to highlight some of the more crucial parts of the episode, and then we break down each character in more detail and how their stories are progressing. That's kind of like how we like to do it on this show. Some episodes of other 
kinds of podcasts. We'll do the the bit by bit, play by play. That's not how we generally like to do it. This week, the the main story takes a look at the shady world of black ops operations as Dr. Linus Creel is using psychology to trigger mass murders in a different way to get his work published. Social, what do they call it? Social psychology. Now, do you think, first of all, well, explain how social psychology works according to the show. According to the show, it's basically a way that you can take someone that has a predetermined disposition in their genome, meaning they have a specific gene that would actually be triggered based on a certain number of events happening to, I guess, turn them into psychopathic killers. Well, it it really seemed like, you know, you take stress points and you focus them and you just barrage them. I mean, just, just a barrage of, of stressful situations. Uh, one was talking about, he was being accused of uh, pedophilia. This woman lost everything she had, her children, her home, those sorts of things. And when those sociological elements come crashing down on them, do they fold? And then they fold on the pressure and basically become killers. Now, I don't know how you do that to make them targeted killers, but it seemed to me like it was more of a focus on can we break people down psychologically by just destroying their world as opposed to a direct threat? Is that what, what you got? I don't think this was an episode like we had last season where it was getting people to key in on specific people to kill specific people. I think this was truly just a way to turn them into killers. Who they killed was totally up to them. Hmm. Well, and, and I do want to say I looked this up. The warrior gene essentially is what they refer to it during the episode. And I thought this has to be a joke. This is ridiculous. It's a real thing. Did you know that? Well, every single person that works a 40 hour work week sitting in a cubicle would technically be, (laughs) I assume disposed to having this warrior gene and could snap under the certain amount of stress that they have. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. I feel bad for all the celebrities because they get this barrage of attack all the time. Anytime they say something stupid, ask Michael Richards. You know what I'm saying? Uh, do you think this this Dr. Creel, do you think his motives essentially are pure? You know, that's a really good question because I watched it again today. And as I got to the end of the episode, he just wanted his research to be proven true. So, again, it's another one of these blacklisters who have good motives but go about it in the completely wrong context. So was this guy truly a blacklister in the end. That's the one thing that I was really scratching my head with this week. He didn't seem as nefarious as some of these other people because he wasn't taking out world leaders. He wasn't causing mass chaos, you know, like a subway blowing up or something like that. He was just literally trying to make his manifesto heard and to stop the government, if you will, from continuing on with this black ops project. Yeah, but he also, I mean, he had no problems in there watching a woman snap and go into a bank and just start shooting people. And I felt so horrible for that woman. She seemed like such a nice, nice, sweet woman. Uh, I told I turned to my wife and I said, you know what? This is exactly how I feel with all the noise and stuff that's going around, the car horns, the stoplight, the people yelling. Like that first part of the episode, I was like, man, I'm watching me. I wonder if I have this warrior gene. <laughs> well, I I immediately lost sympathy for him once I saw who was playing him, and that's David uh, Costable, who was also – he played Gale on Breaking Bad. And he's been in – he's that guy that's been in that show. You know what I mean? He's that guy when you're sitting with your, your spouse or your friends and you see a guy pop on TV, you're like, that's that guy. He's that guy. Most people might remember him from Breaking Bad where he is Gale, and that's the character that – spoiler alert, somebody shoots, right? Yeah. you know. Okay. And, and as I was watching the episode, I was thinking – he plays the character quite well and I never quite understood why he was pulling his hair out other than it was just maybe his nervous tick or if it actually meant something in the long run. I was expecting him to eat it one of those times. Yeah. What was that? Yeah. I, that was just really creepy. That's like a character tick. He's just throwing it in there. Hey, you know what I think I should do guys? I should pull my hair out. Why? I don't know. Maybe he, he's getting stressed. Yeah. And if he's stressed, does that imply that he has the warrior gene as well? And he's trying to uncover things about himself as he does his research. It was just weird that they never did anything with it, even though they kept showing it over and over again. Well, it sure doesn't imply to me that he felt bad about it because he's kind of a jerk. 
and all these people are gunning down innocent people and he's just writing it down or actually putting in his little voice recorder. Why well, he doesn't have a phone? I mean, they have apps for this, by the way. Mr. Advanced Social Psychology. Well, you get better battery life on those smaller recorders, maybe. <laughs> I guess it's possible. I guess it's possible. Now, I really like the uh, the senator. You know, they went and visited the senator. Obviously, he's aware of the program, but he's saying that, hey, it never really worked. Do you think he, in essence, really knew everything that was going on, or was he being upfront? The fact that he said, yeah, I'll have my office send over the files to your office, and it was all redacted, clearly said to me that he knew what was going on, and he wanted the research to continue because they had some secret government program somewhere to create these super soldiers, whatever you want to call it. And because of that, the way he acted and the way he deflected Dr. Creel, that he really did know what was going on and that he didn't want the research to come out because he wanted to continue the program. Do you think this obviously works? Because it really, it, it seems like it does. And and I wonder if if this would be... Do you think this is something that our government actually would do? I mean, we've we've done some shady stuff. Don't get me wrong. We've done some shady things. But do you think this is something we would actually do? The thing that I couldn't grasp my mind around, because it's a super soldier type program concept. Mm -hmm. well, well, not really, though, because it's more like just you're destroying people. I, I really don't get the, the whole point other than we're going to break down people we think uh, we can. That's really, you know, we, we use this test, the standardized test. We locate these people and we destroy their lives. I really don't see what you gain from that other than, yes, people can be broken this way as opposed to um, just taking them out with a sniper's bullet. Certain organizations that would use maybe suicide bombers, that would be a more apt place for this to be. Because if these people are so stressed to the point that they're just going to snap, you can't control them in a militarized operation to execute on point because they're exactly. so frazzled. There's just no way they would be able to do that with any kind of precision or any kind of consistency because they're so stressed out. So I, the only way I could see this happening is that you get them so distraught about their life that they would be suicide bombers. Exactly. Uh, but it would kind of be like, hey, we've got Hank ready. Let's just throw them into Chicago and see what happens. You know, I mean, there's no way you could control this. So I really don't under, I guess I don't understand what purpose it serves other than let's figure out how we can destroy people without, through other means, as opposed to a direct hit implode from the, from the inside in explode for, or implode from the outside, from the inside out. Right. And because the lady at the bank, she never actually killed anybody. It sounded like everybody was just wounded. And then the guy at the end, he just shoots a bunch of bullets in the air to clear out the area he just wants to take out the one girl that he's never met. Their lives are still ruined. I mean, they're not going to just clear her of all charges. She still did it of her own uh, volition, of her own free will, right? I mean, she's still guilty. Right, but there's no way that you could target that. Like, you couldn't use it to weaponize it because there's no way to target somebody specifically. These guys still snapped and wanted to go after something specific. She wanted to go after the guy who took her house away because that was the last straw. He wanted to go after the girl who broke his heart. It's not like he's just coming in and doing like, a, I was expecting him to come in and have literally a mass shooting and kill everybody in that room at that um, public forum and wipe everybody out. That's what I was expecting when he came in with two guns. But then the mm -hmm. fact that he just scared everybody away, waiting for the one person to come out clearly states that this can't be used in a military operation because it's not targetable because it's still controlled by the person's feelings. Yeah, so Dr. Linus, I I think your research research is a little bogus. Basically, you you create ticking time bombs, random time bombs. I don't see how that's a benefit to anybody. And I'm sure somebody listening, you probably have a, a very astute uh, rationalization of this. I would love to hear it. I would love to hear a, an excellent representation of what this benefits any government, other than we can take out, like, say, the senator. Say we need to destroy the senator, but we can't do it with. Um, you know, a sniper's bullet. We need to do it so it looks like it's him. I could get that aspect of it. That's the only benefit I could see to this kind of program. I do want to point out that when Keen is having, and we're going to talk more about the actual conversation a little later, but when she hacks that, or in a second actually, when she hacks that laptop while she's talking to Dr. Creel, that took her about eight seconds. Now, anybody in IT will tell you that, that is not possible. That's TV technology. Well, yeah, but she didn't hack the computer, right? She, she just kind of hacked. 
She she, she booted into a, a root subroutine in the terminal, and Aram actually did the hacking. Now, could Aram do it in eight seconds? He's pretty smart. Really? Because she's just she pulls it out, hits a few buttons, and boom! All right, we got it. It's like TV time. <laughs> it didn't make any sense. It, it's one of those things where all right, we got to accept this because it's TV. But in my head, I'm like, this is not possible. You you just can't do it. I, I don't see any. Uh, you can't do it. TV time. Now, the first thing I thought when I saw this episode, because, again, John Eisendrath works on the show and he worked on Alias. When this was going down, I kind of got a little tingle in my heart for the Sydney Bristow days. And I really thought that she wasn't going to be able to write down the password and she was going to have to kind of lock it into memory like Sydney had to do on many occasion because she had to get it out quickly or move fast or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I, I was really kind of feeling that. And I was hoping she was going to lock it into memory and not actually write it on a piece of paper. But then when she did write it on the script pad, I thought that was really a genius move so that she could get out of that situation. Yeah, it was a great yeah, it was a great bait and switch, too. Very good. Uh, now, about that scene, uh, we're going to move into the characters in a second. But that's really, I would say, a huge portion of this episode because we get – we get a lot of information from her, and, and the conversation begins. You know, she's pretending to be a patient, and for those who saw it, let's flashback. She pretends to be a patient, and uh, while she's talking to Creel, it seems like the story starts to morph into her truth. You know, it, it seems like it begins to be not really the truth. It seems like it's a character, and she does a great – Megan Boone does a great job here, by the way. Uh, she does a, a nice mixture of crazy, junky, slash – wounded slash hurt slash I'm going to kill about four people kind of thing. I really liked what she did here. She did a lot of, a lot of mood changes throughout the scene. Uh, but the, but the scene itself, it, it seemed to me like there was more truth than lies in this scene. You, how did you see it? Well, immediately when she said, you know, my husband, Tom named Tom specifically, that's when I first was like perked up and it's like, okay, well how much of the story is she going to tell now that's truth? Versus how much did she script and pretend ahead of time that mm -hmm. she was able to, because if you're talking deep seated feelings, can you switch on a dime to be able to dive into the bag, open the laptop, do what you need to do and create a diversion to get out of it in case you get caught and still be in that moment of deep feeling. She's talking about the fire and her dad and the scar and Tom, there's a lot of stuff going on there. So how much of it was scripted and how much of it was truly her feelings? And then she fills out the assessment questionnaire and you have to say, okay, did she circle all C's? Did she make pictures or did she actually answer it truthfully? No, I think she answered it truthfully. I, I don't, unless they trained her or conditioned her how to respond, I think she answered honestly. Otherwise, why make it such a big deal at the end of the episode? Well, did the results of the screening come back or was it just the blood test results about the DNA gene that came back in the file at the end? Do we really know if she has the full profile or if she's just susceptible because she has the gene pattern? No, I think she took the test because he gave her the test and then they said the test results. And I maybe I'm making an assumption here, but I do believe that that meant that indicated to us, the audience, that she took the test and the results are back. She is one of these people. Because Creel, at some point between taking the test and the final sequence, was able to analyze her scores and make notes. Yeah. Okay. That's that's what I gathered from it, yeah. All right, let's go into this week's characters. And boy, we've got a few that didn't have to do anything this week, which, all right. Uh, Samar Navabi, Dembi, and Aram, they were basically background characters. I mean, there was a couple point of facts and a, and a couple offhanded remarks here and there, but really these characters are – Nothing this up this week. Would you agree or did you get a little bit more out of them than I did? I got more out of Aram only because there was that really interesting exchange between him and Liz when she's like, well, if I asked you to get these phone records, what would you say? And then he said, yeah, I'd ask if you have a warrant. And then he said something to the effect of, you know, uh, I wouldn't go against you, Lizzie, or something like that. Or why would I have questions to ask? You know, why would I question your motives? I think is what he said. Well, she, yeah, she, she goes up to him and says, you know, if I had you look up some information, what was the information exactly? The phone numbers of Naomi and Frank, right? Right. right. And, then, and then he's like, well, I would need a warrant. She's like, what if, do, would you have to see it? Well, not, not from you, Lizzie. Of course, I trust you, you know, impeccably or whatever. Implicitly. I think, yeah, I, okay, I trust implicitly. you implicitly, Agent Keen. Why would he say that? Do they have some bond? Is there something bigger going on between the two of them that we don't know about? Or are they just, you know, war buddies because of Ansel Garrick? 
Oh, I think you're str- you're stretching now. No, I, I think he just trusts her. I think he believes in her. They're friends. He doesn't think she's going to do anything immoral or illegal with that information. And I think he wants to help her. Why wouldn't she go to wrestler? Uh, because wrestlers, he's been goody two shoes lately. You know what I mean? I mean, he's been, he's back on uh, doing it by the book. Aram seems to understand sometimes you got to get things done. And he also, I think he has a soft spot for where I don't think wrestler, uh, he has that uh, emotional side to him, but really he's not going to be breaking any more laws for her. Okay. No, goodbye that. Especially if he's trying to watch his six because of the pill thing. <laughs> Again with the pill. We haven't seen that in a couple episodes. You think the pills are done? Maybe. Yeah. yeah. They kind of like introduced that and then they kind of tossed it and then they diverted the psychologist, uh, psychiatrist away from him to her with that episode. Uh, was it last week? Last week. Yeah. So that, yeah, very interesting to see that they kind of went away from that story right away. Yeah. They didn't waste much time. It's gone. Gone. Well, Samar, she was interesting this week only because she was able to go out on her own to do those interviews by herself, which I thought was interesting. And then. No, oh, you don't really see it. Yeah, you don't see her in the thing. But she, when she's talking afterwards, she's like, yeah, you know, she was accused of the pedophilia or whatever. And mm-hmm. she was part of the investigative crew, I guess, while the other team was somewhere else. But then at the end of the episode, I thought it was the exchange between her and Liz with the test results was very telling that Liz still doesn't trust her. She's like, yeah, whatever. You know, kind of waved her off and. No big deal. But then she hides the fact that she knows the information from Aram to give Aram the chance to win the bet. So that was interesting, too. Yeah, well, I think maybe she's going to use that information with maybe she's going to give that information to Red, you think? Oh, absolutely going to give the information to Red. That's when Lizzie comes back to she, when Red said, you know, how is the how is your mission? You know, how is your case? And she's like, well, I think you already know. Hmm. See, I'm not convinced that they're working together yet. I mean, I, th- I think that's a red herring. I think that's what you're being fed. I think that's the information being fed, but I'm not convinced yet. Until I see those two having a, a conversation where one shares information with the other, I'm not 100% on board. I think they're, they're, um, I think they're playing us for fools on this one. But didn't he give her the information to get onto the task force in Monarch Douglas? And then at the end of Monarch Douglas, she calls him and says, I'm in? Yeah, but... That's not enough for you? Nope. Okay. Nope. I need more. I need more. I want proof. Man, I believe in evidence. <laughs> I believe in evidence, and I want to see some evidence. Now, you're probably right. I'm probably just being stupid. But I, I that's a conversation I want to see before I jump on board that she's a traitor. Well, I didn't say she was a traitor. I just said that she's passing information to Red. That would be a traitor. Lizzie does the <laughs> same thing. She's a traitor too, just different kind. Okay. Everybody's got everybody's shady in this the show. You know that, right? I like shady though. <laughs> uh speaking of shady, Cooper's got a little extra shade this week because he's talking about how um and even though he didn't really have a lot to do in this episode, he does make it a point to be the guy that finally tells Lizzie that yes, our government does these things, which I think we all know, right? Well, they do these things and it scares me, you know, poopless basically trying to keep it clean, but you know, he just does like, this is the part of the job I hate. Cause it's like, you, you don't want this stuff to be true. And then you find out it is, and he has to deal with that. And I wonder if that scene ties into whatever happened in Kuwait because he was involved with that. And it's just stuff that eats him up inside. Oh, I think this definitely eats him up. I think he's very frustrated with his government. And the reason that it interests me, I guess, is it makes me wonder to any degree, I mean, he gave back whatever potential blackmail he had, or it seems like Red gave that blackmail back. Do you think he's working with Red in some respect against the government secretly? Like, we're, we're not seeing that. Like, maybe he is because, I don't know, his conviction on the fact that the government is sometimes involved in things he's not very proud of. It, to me, it's almost like words are being thrown out that are that most people are just going to toss aside. Where I think maybe we should look at that a little bit more and think maybe down the road we're going to find out that Cooper's working a little deeper with Red than we think. Well, that was kind of the preview information we got about their backstory was that they did go to school together, grew up in the Navy together, exactly. groomed together. So I could buy into that, and I really think if we think about if he's really frustrated with his government. 
and we go back to this Kuwait situation, was he already working against the government and that's why they had to hide it under whatever they did in order to make sure that it didn't come out and why the judge needed to hold him responsible during that episode last year. Oh, I think we're going to get some some really good Cooper stuff as the season goes on. That's my personal opinion. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Now, Mr. Vargas, Mr. Turtleneck, is uh, he's taking on a little bit more involved role. That's Creepy Pee Wee. He's back, and <laughs> he really hates when people don't take care of their dogs. Did you did you think when he's uh when he's showing up and he's scolding them like he breaks in someone's house and then scolds them for how they treat their animal? <laughs> did you think that this woman was Jennifer, Red's daughter, Red's or no? I'm sorry, Naomi's daughter. Yeah, at first when she comes in the door before she's talking on the phone, I was like, okay, there's a girl coming in with a dog. This is Jennifer, right? And then she's like, I thought you were leaving your wife, and I was like, nope, that's not Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> answer that one right away. But I wonder if the dog thing is something that really is one of his ticks, like the getting queasy when you see blood, or mm -hmm. if it was just a ruse and a ploy to not let her have a, a word in edgewise in order to control the situation. So how much is he really, you know, I really want to take care of your dog because I'm a dog lover versus I just need you to shut up and listen because this is the way it's going to go down. Oh, I think he, it seemed like he really believed it. I was kind of on board that he really doesn't like people that doesn't that don't take care of their animals. Now, have we have we agreed yet that Naomi's daughter is Red's daughter, or are we still in debate on this fact? Well, this is my big theory question, and I wish I had a crazy crackpot theory button right now because we need a button. We need a crazy crackpot button. We totally do. Yeah. The concepts that were coming out in these conversations with Naomi and Red, there were just phrases and words and where she decides to pause and not like there was one part where it's like where she said you know because i was married to and it was like she was going to say you but it didn't seem like she was going to say you it looked like she was going to say something else mm -hmm. and then she was okay. talking about it. you know and i kept elizabeth's secret and you know elizabeth how did the two of you end up working together anyway like there's something that she knows that we and elizabeth don't know and then it got me thinking okay, if we're going to all speculate what's behind the door, why don't we just go all out there and just say, maybe Jennifer and Elizabeth are twin sisters. Ooh. Hey, now. Never thought of that. Okay. And the question is, which one is actually there? Is it Liz or is it Jennifer? Or is it like Lord Baltimore and it's the same person in one brain? That's why she's all kind of tricked out at the end of the episode. Oh, now you're blowing my mind, man. Don't, don't, like, I already have enough theories. I don't really didn't need more. <laughs> I told you before we started the show on, on our Facebook, I said, man, I got one that'll just really rip you this week. And I got um, to thinking, it's like, does she have her twin sister locked up behind that door? Now, I don't see, I don't think that's who's behind the door. I think it is Tom behind the door. Because how do you, why would you lock your sister up? That's just evil. Unless you are the evil sister, I guess. Well, the only reason I thought it would be Tom was because of the story. Of the, what would you do if you found your husband? Would you kill him? No, I wouldn't kill him. I'd chain him up and I'd make sure he suffers and I'd get all the answers out of him that I wanted. So she was leading up to make sure that you believe that Tom would be behind the door. But I was like, that's just, it's just so easy and so simple. So then I'm like, okay, well, Jennifer's behind the door then. She found a way to get to Jennifer. And then I'm like, well, what if Jennifer's her twin sister? And I was like, whoa, stop. I had to breathe for a minute because I just blew my own mind. <laughs> well, we'll come back to that door. So just hold that thought. Now, Mr. Vargas, this is really the only scene, this and, and the uh, the next scene we're going to talk about, which is Frank's scene. <laughs> I love favorite scene of the episode for me. I love uh, Red's version of marriage counseling. I thought this was hysterical where he basically tell lays it out for him and, and says, I, we took care of your mistress. Uh, she's going to be fine, but let us we're letting you know that we found her. And you're going to go back and you're going to make that woman happy. And he's like, well, I'm not going to do that. How's I'm going to go be with my lady, which is really what I got was the whole reason why he didn't want to leave. Right. It's really because he didn't want to leave his new girlfriend. Did you get you get that? Yeah, totally. I, he wanted to stay yeah. in Philadelphia because he had this mistress on the side, which I like that we got introduced to the mistress herself before actually learning about it from Red through Frank. So that that was a really nice twist on the writer's part this week to meet the mistress first because all we heard was Naomi going, this man loves me. This man will do everything for me. And then you're like, oh, crap, he's got a mistress. Whoa, 
that's going to be a really interesting wrinkle. <laughs> Apparently she doesn't know about her. No, she doesn't know. But I did. This to me is showed that red does care about Naomi quite a bit because the fact that he was willing to, I mean, you know, play pickup sticks and threaten him with that. That was impressive. Uh, he was flat out going to kill him. And I really believe he was going to kill him. Either you go back and you make this woman happy or you're dead. Those are really your two options. Right. I'm holding your feet to the fire to hold up your end of the bargain. You married her. You decided to be with her. And she's madly in love with you and completely hates my guts. We're more like sisters and brothers at this point. So you do your job and I'll do mine and I'll make sure you're safe. Yeah. But to me, that says he does care about her. He does care about her well-being. A lot of people are painting that maybe he doesn't really care about her. He just needs her. He could easily take care of her if he really wanted to. And when I say take care of her, I mean drop her in a river. I mean, you know, he could take her on an airplane ride where she gets out about 30,000 feet early. You know, there's a lot of different things he could do if he really wanted to. He's not doing that. He's actually trying to make sure she's safe. He cares about her. And he's actually willing to <laughs> blackmail her happiness, <laughs> which I like. I really like. I really liked it too. And she cares about him because last week she's slapping him across the face. This week she's actually standing there letting Raymond kiss her on the forehead in front of her husband. Yeah, that was a very soft moment. I was actually waiting for, I don't know, maybe he was going to make a move. He's just going to move his head right when she when she went in. That's what I would have done. I'm like, oh, sorry, Frank. I got her. Uh, Haskell, we've got a new player in the game. Now, Haskell is a guy that uh, Red needed when he's trying to get a little bit more information on this program. Was it Sub Project 7? Is that what it was? Correct. Uh, so he goes to see Haskell, and apparently the last time they met was a, as a bad match of craps, right? Apparently it sounds like Haskell lost a lot of money at craps. Yeah, they won like twenty five grand, and then he lost double that after Red had disappeared. Yeah, and it sounds like he has a little bit of a gambling problem. Is that what you got? Yeah, he had some kind of addiction issue that was there, and Red exploited him for it. Yes, very much, which sounds just like Red. I like this guy. I, I don't really know what more, uh, and, and you went over it in your opening, but what are the three points that he mentioned today? Yeah, he mentioned after he has this like creative ability to play jigsaw puzzles with redacted information that he was able to put together the fact that this project has three phases. Phase one is disruption of your everyday tasks and doings. Phase two is destabilizing your kind of, you know, person and who you are and what your foundation is. And then phase three is to sever all primary emotional bonds. So I guess that makes you think about your parents and I want my mommy and all that jazz. Genius. And I, I am personally going to try this. I want to make kids now. So thanks for the tip. I'm going to see if I can do a little social uh, social uh, psychology with my children. Why not? Right. Let's have fun. That This guy is a character I actually hope comes back pretty soon. I think they could uh, use him quite a bit, actually, especially when you think about all the redacted stuff they were seeing in season one. Now mm -hmm. they have a resource. And I really love, and Samar comes into play here because she's the one that actually says, hey, there's a guy out there like this. We should use him. And then that's when Liz, of course, goes back to Red and says, hey, do you know this guy? And Red's like, that's what they call him. That's funny. <laughs> now, I think you want Sam Samar to have a bigger part in this episode than she really did. I really didn't think, like, she just had a couple offhanded comments. I really didn't. She wasn't a big focal point of the episode. This guy, actually, I think had more solid screen time. The reason why I like uh, Haskell, and, and I know we've had a lot of bit characters. Uh, Vargas seems like he's going to be used a lot more. I like Haskell because he seemed formidable to Red. He didn't seem shaken up by Red. He didn't seem intimidated by Red. And I think we need more characters like that because there's far too many people who are afraid of Red. Does that make sense? It totally does. And I have to ask you the question, did they screen test Nico? Because I really liked Nico. I thought he was a cool cat. It's a shame that he got one in the chest. But this guy <laughs> even looked like Nico, so... Were there people that were like, I really like Nico, and now they have to bring back a Nico-like guy? <laughs> Possibly, sure. I, I I really hadn't thought about it until you just brought that up. That's that's an interesting way to look at it, my friend. He looks so much like him at first. I was like, oh, it's, it's Nico again. And it, It's Nico. He put on goofy glasses, so it's a different guy. How fun would that be if they had the same actor? That would be interesting. Twin brothers. <laughs> Uh, well, that's Haskell and good character. I really liked him. Very fun. I hope he comes back. I don't know if he is. 
I'm sure somebody out there has has those kind of spoilers. We try not to look ahead. We try to only talk about the episodes we know about. I think it's important for us as well as you guys listening. Wrestler. Now, for me, and I talked about background players earlier, he really didn't do much for, for this episode. Other than point his gun and tell and ask a couple of rudimentary exposition questions, I really don't think that he had a lot to do with this episode. Do you think that because of all the other stuff going on, Wrestler's character is suffering a little bit? Potentially, but we've now shipped Naomi off to somewhere else. So I think Wrestler will come back into the fold more, especially as we uncover whatever Liz's secret is. Mm -hmm. But he did have the one line tonight that I think everybody forgets. We always talk about, you know, Red's a criminal at the end of the day, and he's standing there clearly saying, this is a diversion. We should be focusing on Red. Why are you people missing the boat here? And everybody's just kind of like, yeah, wrestler, go take some pills. Say that line again. I want to think about it for a second. Well, he said, it's like, you guys understand, he's putting us on this case because he's the one that told Liz hey, did you know that violent crime is up? Reston has this shooting. You should look into this. You know, look into this instead of asking me about Naomi. Go do this instead. And wrestler mm -hmm. goes, he only wants us to look at this because he's got something else going on that he doesn't want us involved with. This is a complete diversion. That is true. That is what he does every week. You'd think that apparently he's the only one then that's picking up on it. You think Keen, well, Keen's aware of it, right? I mean, she said that in the staircase when she's on the phone with him. She knew that... This whole thing is basically to keep keep her off the scent of Naomi. True, but she's still going along and playing along with it because she has that sense of we need to save whatever's going on. Or she's thinking that if I do this case, it'll lead me to something else that'll lead me to Naomi. The wrestler's just like, you guys go play in your own backyard. I'm going to go find wherever Red is and go tail his plane. <laughs> Well, I really hope that they bring him more to the forefront or to the, yeah, to the forefront because he's a character I like. They were really starting to rebuild him the first couple of episodes. And then the last couple, he's kind of gone back to the background. It, it's almost to me like you have too many characters going on right now. I, I think they're playing a chess match and I think they're moving the pieces around, but I still really want a little bit more um, depth of that character because he's, he is the the strong noble character in the show. He's the only, really the only noble one left because Cooper's got issues and obviously Keen is com uh, compromised and red. He's just got no morality left really. So wrestler is really the, the audience's morality. And I think he needs to play a bigger part in each episode. Well, and I think it depends on how they're setting up the season, because for those that don't know, the show is only going to be on for eight weeks. So November 10th, I believe is going to be the mid season finale and it's what stories do they want to move along to what climax that might be? Is it going to be a pseudo finale? Is it going to be a cliffhanger? Because then the blacklist goes away until February where they're going to have the post Super Bowl slot as a first part of a two parter before it moves into its Thursday home in the winter. So, I think that's really the question is even though wrestler might be a background character now, is it because he's not really part of the story they're trying to tell over these first eight and then he'll come back into the fold when it comes back in the winter. That's very possible. Yeah. Very possible. I want to talk to you more about that, that uh, season split, but I'll wait until the end of the episode. Okay. Okay. Um, Naomi, does she know red is manipulating things or do you think she's sold that Frank changed his mind? With the dog showing up, women are always falling into love with the dog. So I think that's the distraction. So she does fall into Frank and what Frank is saying. If she truly believed what she said, which is this man would do everything for me and he truly loves me. So why would she not blindly follow him in whatever he decides? So if he changes his mind and says, let's move, then she believes it. Let's move. Wow. You really, you believe in love, don't you? I do. I feel like Cher is going to start singing any second. Now, speaking of love, do you think there's a little love between her and Red right there at the end? Do you think there's a little glimmer of a little something, something? Obviously, she said Carla Reddington was a glorified housewife. She doesn't exist anymore. So it's clear that they were married or at least in some long-term relationship, maybe like Tom and Liz. Mm -hmm. The kids, however, is where I start to scratch my head. You know, were they really their kids or was Jennifer really her kid and not red's kid 
And then there's still the question of Elizabeth and, you know, her paternity and that jury's still out. So do I think that she cares for Reddington? Absolutely. Do I think she wants to be anywhere near Reddington? No, she wants to get as far away from him as possible. And your theory is that the child he thinks died in the fire. Well, obviously he would have to know. The child that everybody thinks died in the fire is actually Liz. And her twin sister is Jennifer. That's your that's your mind-blowing theory. I'm not saying that Elizabeth is tied to either one of them in any way, shape, or form, unless it's a potential twin sister thing, in which case then Red thinks that his family was slaughtered in the fire. And again, this isn't to say that this is this family, right? He was married to Carla Reddington. Carla, right? Yes. Did I yes. get it right? Yeah. Carla Reddington at some point. It's not to say that he wasn't married again. We don't know which family he had. He could have had 20 families the way Reddington operates in 20 different countries. <laughs> Suddenly he's Mormon. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Polygamy is all around. You know, he'll cheat on a jelly donut and he'll cheat with a different gun. Wow. You really just, you just said, you went, you went all out on that one. That'll be interesting. I really, I like your theory. Your, your theory is interesting because it, it's crazy. And I like that. Now, her conversation with Keen, this is one of those TV conversations, okay? And, and I got to tell you what I mean. These are the kind of conversations that I want to punch my television over because nobody seems to want to ask the exact question that they want to know. You know, there's all this beating around the bush. Well, what do you think it means? And all that crap. If if this is me in, in real Aaron's world, Aaron grabs her and throws her on the ground and beats her until she tells me what I'm asking, what I really want to know. Because this whole back and forth, playing coy and everything else, that becomes frustrating to me. And and I know some people are like, well, you know, you got to tease it out in the show. I get that. But there's a nonsensical thing about it that when you're watching it, it's really hard to get behind the characters when you know in your head they should just be asking the simple question, who, where do, where am I? Where do I stand in all this? Don't give me any BS. Don't give me all this psychological babble. Just tell me where I fit. And nobody ever seems to want to ask that question when it matters. They wait until Red walks in the room. You know what I mean? Any other show, I agree with you. This show, you don't know who knows who and what knows what. So if Liz were to throw her down and confront her, she could just as easily kick her butt because she might be worse than Red for all she knows because she doesn't know anything about Naomi at this point. And then more importantly, Naomi in the back of her mind is going, Red has ears and eyes everywhere. He could be standing out on the porch, which he was, and therefore she doesn't want to screw up anything with her deal because she pisses off Red by leaking information she's not supposed to leak. Man, I I get what you're saying. I, I know where you're coming from, but this it, it's frustrating. As a viewer, it's frustrating. It's like don't put them in the situation where they're together and and you hype it up like we're going to get answers. And then you, and then we don't get anything. It, it's very frustrating as a viewer. And I love the show, but that's a frustrating moment for me because you, you get us jacked up that we're going to get some answers and we just get questions that are asked horribly, in my opinion. Uh, not horribly, I should say. Questions that aren't fully formed that actually ask what the characters really want to know. They don't get straight to the point. You know, when you know Keen knows, she doesn't have a whole lot of time here. You don't, you never know when Red's going to come back in the room. So I only have two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, whatever that number is to ask Naomi everything I want to ask her. I would run in that room and I just have my laundry list and go through them and like check, 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 check. That That's how I think most people would handle it. But I go back to an earlier episode of the podcast where you said maybe the answer isn't as simple as we would like it to be. And maybe it's more complex. Like you said, he's her father, but she's not her father because... You know, in his mind, he she has to die in order for him to go on and all of that jazz that you mentioned. So when she comes back with the, well, what do you think he is to you or what does he mean to you? It, it's kind of that situation. It, the answer isn't black and white. The answer is something deeper that hasn't been uncovered yet. Well, I think it's a different kind of conversation because what I was speaking and I like how you throw my own words back at me. Touche, sir. Touche. <laughs> but I think uh, what I what I think the problem that I have at this particular scene is that it's very relaxed and very coy and it's not as blunt as it should be for the time allotted. And the fact that I just found you and I only have a limited amount of time. It's not so much the, the 
it's not entirely the answers that are being given. It's that the questions aren't direct. They're very broad. And for that situation, it, it just doesn't, it didn't make sense to me. It didn't float truth to me, I guess. I had a, I had a hard time with that one scene. Well, she could be sitting across from her mother for all she knows. Mm -hmm. and, and does that change her behavior in the way that she addresses Naomi because of that? Is she in her mind going, I don't even know what to ask because I'm just trying to figure out who the heck you are in relation to Red while I'm trying to figure out why Red thinks I'm so important to him. So she's not sure which question to ask and she stumbles over her own words, basically. So I'm taking it you really like the scene. I thought it was enough to give me a nugget knowing that there are still whatever, 19 episodes left of season two, <laughs> you know, 18 episodes left of season two. So I can't do math on a podcast, but mm -hmm. because of that, I'm, I'm okay with it for right now. If this was like episode eight at the cliffhanger and it wasn't a specific diversion because of a cliffhanger, then I probably would have been more in your camp, but I'm okay to let it slide for a little bit. All right. Well, we'll see as we go. Uh, the last two characters, Keen and red, Keen, uh, the one thing that comes up is I saw your test results. We kind of talked about that. So we don't really need to revisit that, really. Yeah, I think we covered it. Well. Or what more do you want to add to it? Her look on her face as she's spinning the keys, right? Is she in that mindset at that point different all of a sudden because now she knows she has the gene? Or would she have looked that same way not knowing the test results? Oh, I don't think the test results played into that at all. That look I got from her while she's spinning the keys is, do I want to go in there and finish this? That's what I, that's what I got. Whatever it is that she needs to finish, that's what I got out of that, out of that look. She had a look like a, like a, like an angry Jaguar. I mean, she was just ready to pounce. That's what I got. Okay. So now here's super crazy, weird, whacked out theory number two for the night. There's a cougar behind the door. No, it's, it's not. It's not a cougar. It's not okay. 24. It's not Kimba. No. All right. The dream sequence is really stuck in my head for the week because it's her interpretation. It's her brain mm -hmm. showcasing these images, right? Mm -hmm. She was worried about Tom getting killed by Red, which is why Red comes in and kills Tom in the dream sequence. So my thought was I go back to the Monarch Douglas Bank. And Red says, I don't understand, Liz, how you have a little informant that told you about Monarch Douglas. Combine that with the dream sequence. Combine that with this secret door and the fact that we just learned about Jennifer. And I put three together. I was going to say two and two, but it's really three points. I put those three points together and I come up with maybe her and Tom are actually working together. She moved the body. She was okay with whatever Tom told her as he slunk down at the end of the season one finale. And Tom is the informant and he found Jennifer and that's why Jennifer's behind the door. And you think she's like hiding her? She's kidnapped her? Right. Because something just seems like she's got one up on red. Every one of these episodes and he even alluded to it. It's like, if, if I only knew what you were thinking, he says it right at the end of the episode as she walks away. Like, if I only knew what you were keeping a secret or something like that, and that led me to believe, okay, she has a secret and Red doesn't know it, so she's one-upped him, and how could she one-up him other than getting the one person that knows Red better than her, which would be Tom? I, I see that. I would see it more along the lines of Jennifer is an informant. She found her. So Jennifer is cluing her in on some information. Now, I don't think Jennifer's in that room, though. I still, I'm with a vast majority of blacklisters that believe that Tom is in that room. I'm kind of of that mindset because I, I just don't have any reason to think she would chain up an innocent girl in uh, in that room for no reason. So would you take my theory then and spin it a different way and say maybe she's using Jennifer as the informant and Jennifer helped her find Tom? I don't know if I'm on board with the twin sister theory yet, but it does it does hold some credence. I mean, I I see some rationalization there. I definitely think Tom's in that room. I think she's beating the crap out of him. I think she's got him tied up to a spike board, and she's just you know waterboarding him. Whatever else they do in the CIA, whatever other evil or FBI, I'm sorry, whatever other uh, evil uh, traps that she found while she was looking at black ops information. You know, she's doing all these experiments on him in one place. That's what I think. But yeah, it would make sense to me that Jennifer is an informant 
and she found her and she, because she does have access to that because she was in witness protection, right? And now Naomi doesn't know where she is, but maybe Keen found a way to find her. We just aren't aware of it yet. So she's using the, Jennifer to get information on Red. Wouldn't it be great if season one was all of these pieces of the puzzle are leading up to this one Berlin moment, right? It was all about how Red moves the pieces. And what if season two is really how Liz moves the pieces? I think actually that's what I'm seeing. I, I see that Red is, and we'll, we'll morph right into uh, to Red. Uh, he is basically protecting his ass and his assets this, this episode, right? I mean, that's really all he's doing. The entire episode, he's covering up for problems, which isn't which isn't the typical red. You know, throughout most every episode, it is red thinking far, far ahead. This time, it, it seems like he's been caught up to and he's covering his mistakes and he realizes that Keen might be one step ahead of him. Do you think this is for, for me? I kind of saw this episode at, at the very end. I saw it as is this the episode where things get flipped on red a little bit and he's no longer in control of every scenario. The only reason I don't like that is because of Haskell. Why would he bring Liz along? Why wouldn't he just go with somebody else, maybe even Samar, uh, to go get that information and then feed that information to Liz a different way? Mm, I don't know. I mean, sure, there's a lot of holes. That's a, that's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. But if you think about it, that is what he did the whole episode. I mean, the whole episode, he's trying to uh, he's trying to get leverage on Frank because he he didn't have that mapped out. He didn't expect her to say or expect Frank to say, no, I'm not going to go. He didn't expect Naomi to cause him so much trouble. He didn't expect um, Keen to have an, to have information and find Naomi. He didn't expect that. He didn't think that she would be able to. He really thought, I'd put her off the scent. She's not going to find her. I'm going to have this taken care of before she can ever get here. And lo and behold, she finds a way to get there. She has information. She is no longer just his pawn. She has moved up to maybe a rook or a bishop. Nice. Throwing my words back at me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, I agree with you, though. I, he was definitely playing defense this week where he's always been playing offense. And I wonder if we'll see more defense as the weeks progress leading up to that winter break, if you will. Yeah. Which uh, brings us back because I mean, is there anything in the episode we missed? I, I think we covered pretty much everything. Yeah, I think we're good. Ah, that was a lot. That's a lot of show, man. That was a lot of show. Now the break before we, before we move on and, and do some other stuff, and talk about Red's rhetoric, which is a lot of people's favorite part of the show. Uh, that's really a uh, nice job with that, by the way. That's that's all Troy. Troy's done all that work. Do you think this break is too long? Because there, there's essentially a two-month break between the first eight episodes and the final 16 are going to burn off at the same, you know, one after another. Do you think that's too long? Is that is that stretching it a little bit? Or is are we okay with that? Because, you know, Lost and 24 and shows like that have shown that that, that can work. For me being an avid TV watcher, I am really liking the 13 episode season format that a lot of networks are going to Fox being one of them uh, with like sleepy hollow and the following. And I like original programming year round. So unless you're going to show me all 22 episodes, bang straight through, I don't mind the winter break as long as there's enough interest peak advertising to keep the memory of people top of mind awareness up so that when it does return, number one, it's going to have to battle the fact that it's moving to Thursdays. Mm -hmm. I believe it's going up an hour earlier. If memory serves, it may, it may still be on at 10, nine central. It may be going up an hour earlier, which means now it's going up against Shonda rhymes. And I know a lot of ladies love their red, but a lot of ladies love their Shonda rhymes too. So that's going to be the real big stickler. Can this move out of its post voice time slot and still do 20 million viewers? Yeah. And why are they moving it? Like, and I'm not, I'm not judging the network. I'm sure they have a very fiscally responsible reason for that. I just don't know what it is. It's to, every single network has the same strategy. And for these guys, it's, it's launch a new show after the voice. It's their biggest show on the network. So whatever can't stand on its own two legs yet, put it on after the voice and when we know it can stand on its own two legs, we use it to anchor somewhere else to then launch something else. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, 
Well, I mean, I hope it works for him because obviously I don't want the show to lose any viewers. I just think it's a dangerous move where you have it go that far uh, off course. I mean, it's it's like a two month, two or three. It's like really, it's like three months. But it's going to have gazillions of people watching post Super Bowl. That's true. So yeah, that's true. We did get the the ample slot. And the way that they're writing that is, it's going to be part one after the Super Bowl, and then in just four days or five days. Again, I can't do math. It'll be on Thursday night with part two. So it's not like you're going to have to wait seven days for part two. So I like the re the relaunch strategy. I think that's smart. So it'll be really interesting to see how big that Super Bowl episode is, because if you're an Alias fan and go back to John Eisendrath working on both shows, Alias season two, I think it was like episode seven or eight was their post Super Bowl episode. And it was the big episode we'd all been waiting for as Alias fans up to that point. And so if they can do something similar to that, I think it's going to be awesome. Well, we'll we'll definitely find out. It's just something I wanted to ask you about because I know we've kind of alluded to it, and that is November tenth is is the the mid season finale. So I believe so. Yep. Now let's go to Red's rhetoric. Given the feedback from the community, it is clear that even though little blue pills are fun in more ways than one. You all heeded Red's lesson last week and value loyalty above all else. The first clip this week, Red shows just how far his hand, or in this case, stick, can stretch during his conversation with Frank. But from this point forward, there is only Naomi. She believes you to be an honest man, Frank, faithful. And that is what you will become. You're going to accept my protection and leave Philadelphia. No. I'm going to call the cops, turn you in. You're not going to get away with this. You make her happy. That is the only reason you're still here. Go get it, boy. City dog. The second clip features his disappointment in Liz when she complains about receiving his help. How'd your case go? I think you know the answer to that. Who is he? Who is who? The gunman, the sniper. He works for you, doesn't he? Yes. How long has he been following me? Since the day Agent Malik died. I want him gone. <laughs> My associate saves your life, and instead of saying thank you, you try to get him fired. If I knew better, I'd say you were hiding something. Which clip from Red do you like this week? If you are all about city dogs, send a tweet with the hashtag Red Dog. If you prefer to show a little gratitude toward Red, then tweet with the hashtag Red Sniper. Make sure to mention at the Blacklist GSM in your tweet, and thanks for voting. All right, now it's time for Special Agent Intel. Lee from Houston, he posed this question on Facebook. Could Red ultimately be grooming Liz to replace him? I saw this today, and I was like, wow. That's even better than my crazy crackpot theories. I really think this is interesting. But do you think it's true? You know, I don't know. But at the same time, the way that he is introducing Liz to his network of people and the way he potentially operates. And if there is some kind of familial tie, familial, I can't say that word, some part of mm -hmm. family ties that it could be a grooming situation. I, I actually kind of like that concept and that idea because then the show could go on sans red because of the way they set up that architecture to hand it off. Yeah. I really like that idea. I think it's a great theory. <laughs> I kind of wish I would have thought of that, but uh, it, it does make sense. That's probably one of the few theories I haven't heard. So, you know, as many theories as we've heard, that's not one I've heard. I'm not saying you haven't heard it, but I have not heard that. I did have not you? hear it. And that's why I like keyed in on it. I was like, Ooh, that's a really good one. Uh, Lee, can I use that on the podcast? Cause that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That That is a good theory, and, and I, it never occurred to me. Now, obviously, that would be a long-term goal because we probably got 
six, seven, eight more years or whatever the show runs. But yeah, that, that's good. I like that. Next, we've got Todd in Illinois. He says, hi, Troy and Aaron. Todd here to send him my feedback for this week's episode of Blacklist. I give Dr. Linus Creel nine out of 10 city dogs. <laughs> Touche, sir. Number one, Keen is doing more off the book stuff. It is going to be a problem soon. I think it's a problem now, Todd. <laughs> I think she's, like I said last week, she's concerned to me about what her, uh, her credentials for being an FBI law enforcement officer are at this point. Number two, I'm not a scientist, but don't you need a control to compare your test results to determine a, a real correlation? So did the doctor try to break people without the gene? Good point. Troy? That's a really good point. I didn't think of that. And if you want to have your case study out there, you would have to have control samples. Well, hey, I, I'm not a scientist, so I just wait for the results on CNN like everybody else. Number three, it's Sniper Jim. <laughs> did Reddington... <laughs> I like that that caught on. Did uh, Reddington not want Keen to find out about the test results? So she, so does she have the gene or not? I don't know how he could know what that guy was saying. How could he possibly know? Unless he has her bugged, I guess. But I think he was just protecting her, yeah? I think it was just the protection mechanism because he's been following her around constantly per their conversation at the end of the episode on the bench. So when he saw Gun to Head... Then sniper guy goes, okay, I'm going to see how this plays out for two seconds. And if it's not playing out the way I like it, I take anybody out that's in the way. Yeah, that's, that's what I got. And I think she definitely has the gene. I think everybody has the gene. Seriously. Most people, a lot of people, a lot of people have the gene. How's that? But I, I, yes, I definitely think the results showed that she is, uh, she is definitely susceptible to this social psychological condition. Number four, how did Red know that Naomi doesn't know about the affair? Uh, how That's a really Red good know? question. That is a really good question. Um, my guess is that he understands women. I think there was that line that Naomi actually said, Red understands women better than anybody. She was saying that to Liz at the end. And if you take that into account, then maybe when Red hears her pining and swooning over this guy, the, he immediately like says red flag. This guy is not that into her the way she's into him. And so then he starts doing some of his secret detective work on the back end with his network to go find this mistress. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. I, I don't think she knows. She doesn't seem like she knows. I don't know. Would she be so adamant? Well, I guess maybe she'd be adamant about bringing him with if she did know about it to get her, get him away from her. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Red knows everything. That's that's my answer to that question. Number five, City Dogs is definitely my pick for Red's rhetoric. Wait, what? Hang on, hang on a second. Aram, Aram, are you, Aram, are you in my computer again? How did you know I was going to use City Dogs for the rhetoric? <laughs> uh, that's all for now. Until next time, this is Todd in Illinois reminding you to avoid like psychopathic ex husbands. They'll stab you with deadly twigs. It's genius, by the way. I. When I'm looking at it, I'm like, really? Did you just break a twig and he let you, he took the time to watch you do that? I would have been running for my life. Make sure you use dead sticks though, because live ones, they bend. They don't poke. <laughs> now, Jess in Atlanta did not get in any feedback this week. I know collective gasp, right? She wasn't able to watch the show. I mean, how, how do you not watch it live? It's <gasps> That's my collective gasp. You like it? <laughs> But to make it up, Jess did actually send in an iTunes review where she said that she's loving the Blacklist Exposed podcast. So thank you, Jess. We look forward to hearing from you next week. Also, some other iTunes reviews came in from Blondie 460, a thought-provoking podcast. Go hang a salami. I'm a lasagna hog. And I bet they didn't think I was actually going to be able to read that. <laughs> said Troy and Aaron, colon, Blacklist. And Station 514 said Spectacular. The iTunes reviews have been through the rough. I just have to say thanks to everybody for submitting those in just these uh, few short weeks that we've had. It's been really great reading all of them. You guys can all go out there and read them yourself. I encourage you to do so. Markham is helpful in iTunes. Uh, that's actually really great for other people when they find the podcast. You can go ahead and read all those reviews over at goldenspiralmedia.com slash iTunes. Click on Blacklist Exposed. And while you're there, if you haven't left a review, go ahead and do so because it really helps out. And for your Stitcher user, thumbs up as well. 
Well, that will conclude this episode of The Blacklist Exposed. Be sure to follow us on Twitter this season at The Blacklist GSM. We're going to be live tweeting during the East Coast feed, and we will use the show's hashtag, The Blacklist. We also have a Facebook group. Just search for The Blacklist Exposed and join us for the fun. Also, the website will have all the episode intel and analysis, as well as links to ep- to subscribe to the feed in iTunes and Stitcher. That way, you don't miss an episode. Visit goldenspiralmedia.com slash the blacklist for details. And intel from all of you is what we want, so you can do that in a few ways. First, give us a call. You can do that at plus one three zero four eight three seven two two seven eight. And if talking on the phone isn't quite your thing, you can head on over to goldenspiralmedia.com slash feedback, and then you could submit an MP3 of your own voice, leave some feedback in writing. You can even use the send voicemail button right on the page to go ahead and send that in via your computer or your smartphone. You can do that right on the webpage. It's a pretty cool feature. We want to make sure that all of that intel gets into us by Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern time as we do record Tuesday nights and put out the show Wednesday morning. All right, and as you leave your feedback, be sure to mention the Blacklist Exposed. And a big thank you for listening this week. Please uh, please remember, we really do appreciate it, really do. This week, don't forget to answer our profiling question of the week, which is who or what is behind Lizzie's secret door? That sounds actually really dirty when you say it out loud. It certainly does. Until next time, I am Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. If you're a fan of Resurrection on ABC, be sure to check out my other show, Resurrection Revealed, over at ResurrectionRevealed.com. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can find me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, available at TheHollywoodOutsider.com. We just updated our website, so definitely go check that out. Be sure to come back next time as we chat about The Front. In the meantime, make sure to keep yourself off of The The Blacklist. Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production, copyright 2014. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.